So hello everyone uh, to the third edition of the sales workshop. Um, it, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Um, so mostly virtual, but also hello to the participants in Freiburg, of course. Uh, and um, the, it, it's actually organized by Thomas Novak and uh, Manish Kushwaha, which you see here in the, in the little videos. And it, 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 it's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, um, so it's actually organized that we have slots of one hour um, with talks and discussions inside. And then uh, we have first two talks, then we have a break for lunch of one hour, and then we have three talks again. Yeah? And uh, for the questions, the best thing is you type it in the Zoom window, um, and, and we, we, uh, either we, we schedule it in a way that, um, depending on time, and we will either read it out or let you read it out there. And, and then you, and we can start a discussion about this. I think this is the, the best way to do. And uh, just, just a, a last word about the participants. So I think we started off with 15 participants in the first sales workshop, and we are now at 172 registrations yesterday evening. So it has grown considerably, and we are actually very happy about this because we think this is actually a very cool topic um, that, that we will hear today uh, from the speaker's talks. Huh? And now, now, yeah, so let, 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 let's start with, uh, with, with Luca, who is uh, already here. And it's a great pleasure to introduce him, to have him here. Um, so Luca um, has a master and, and a PhD from Pisa and Edinburgh. So he has worked previously in Bell Labs, Dex Systems Research Center, and Microsoft Research. And he's currently a professor at the University of Oxford. And his interests um, are programming languages and concurrency, and recently also programmable biology. And we will hear about this in a second. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so when I was asked to give this talk, I thought I would give a, a straightforward algorithm talk. But since this is the first talk of the workshop and it's uh, I have a full hour, so I will do a lot more background uh, uh, at the beginning on, on the whole area of, uh, in this case, DNA computing. Um, so the, um, uh, the plan, Oh, it's not moving there. The plan is to um, have three parts. Uh, the first part is a general background, how to go from any, uh, you know, quote, quote, any digital or analog system to a system of chemical reactions. Um, and the second part is how to implement those systems of chemical reactions with, uh, with real molecules, and in particular with DNA molecules. And the third part will be the, uh, the, the uh, one particular algorithm in this, uh, in this area that tries to detect molecular events, in particular the order of, of molecular events. Um, so let's start with the part one. Again, general introduction. The, the second part will be needed to understand the third part. Uh, so that's good, good to have time to talk about that. But the first part is just you know, general introduction, general introduction to, to the area. So um, uh, here we're gonna see how to go from almost any algorithm, almost any dynamical system to a you know, equivalent uh, system of chemical reactions. Uh, so what, what are chemical reactions? So we, the, the model that we discuss is called chemical reaction network CRN, it's a very specific model of chemical reactions. And you write uh, chemical reactions like in high school, you know, X plus Y goes to Z plus W. These are uh, called species. Each species like X uh, is a collection of molecules. Uh, usually a large collection, like billions of X's and billions of Y's. Um, and you have a, a reaction rate, R, uh, which is the speed at which these uh, two molecules, in, uh, the species interact and produce these other species. So this in, in, in classical, in the sciences, this is a phenomenological model. So you look at nature, you look what nature does, and you write it down, and you write it down the reactions that nature executes. And that's it. You, you just record uh, what's what's happening out there. And X, Y, Z, and W, uh, there will be specific molecules, uh, oxygen, whatever, um, the specific chemicals that uh, that you have. It could be very complicated. Chemical could be proteins, for example, which are you know, uh, tens of thousands of molecules for a single uh, 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 atom for a single for a single molecule. But um, that's that's how you write them. However, you can also think of this as a programming language because. Uh, uh, our genome is a program, and it's uh, it's a fan fanatically coding some very complicated chemical system that gets produced from the genome. So you can think of the of the chemical reactions written in the genome as a program that executes and produces these other uh, chemicals in, in the real world. 
Uh, so as a programming language, again, it's finite. The genome is finite, so everything is finite here is fine. Um, as a mathematical structure, uh, the, the, this notion of chemical reactions in this, more or less in this shape has been rediscovered many, many times. Uh, it, it has been called vector addition systems or petri nets. Uh, if you know petri nets, this is just a transition from a bunch of tokens to another bunch of tokens. Um, uh, Bounded context free languages, population protocols, they're all you know, fairly similar uh, 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 models of, of a computation or, or other things. And most of all, uh, a, a chemical action is a description of mechanism. So these are instructions or interactions between things, as opposed to description of behavior, where you would use uh, equations or approximations uh, to describe the, the behavior of the system. So there's this duality between mechanism and behavior, and chemical action are good to describe mechanism, how, how things actually execute, how they actually, actually work, as opposed to you know, what they look like uh, when, when, uh, from, from a higher point of view. Uh, although, although these two things are related in a very precise way, you can go from mechanism to behavior very, very easily, following certain laws. And you can also go backwards, and I will describe you how, specifically how to go backwards from, from behavior to mechanism. Um, so let me give you some examples of programs in this programming language of chemical reactions, just to start off. Uh, on the left hand side, we have specifications, and on the right hand side, we have the implementations with chemical reaction networks. So, suppose that uh, your specification says you have a, a set X of molecules and you want to obtain a set Y, which is twice the size of X. Well, so this you can do with a, just this one instruction uh, network that says that you have one X and you get two Y's. So, for each X, you get two Y's, so you double the number of X into, into Y. Uh, if you want to divide by two instead of multiplying by two, similarly, you get with the, the rounding error if, if things are uh, odd or even, but you can take two molecules of X and get one molecule of Y, so you divide by two. If you want to sum two populations, uh, X1 and X2, where you send X1 into Y, you also send X2 into Y, and now Y is the sum of X1 and X2. And more, maybe more interesting, if you want to put the minimum of X1 and X2, again, a single instruction, you, you run this reaction that says, you take one x1, you take one x2, you make a y, and eventually either x1 or x2 will run out, and so you will end up with as many y's as the minimum of x1 and x2. So that is easy. Of course, you can write more interesting programs. For example, if you if you th think of uh, implementing the max to the mean, well, the max is a real algorithm now because you cannot do it with a single instruction. So we're going to use this fact that the max of x1 and x2 is equal to x1 plus x2 minus the minimum of x1 and x2 simple mathematical fact. So we want to implement this uh, expression here. So uh, first of all, there's a sum. So we send x1 into y and x2 into y to make the sum. But you, we need to copy x1 and x2 because we need to reuse them here. So we're copying them into L1 at the same time. So now we have uh, the sum y. We also have the copy of x1 L1 and the copy of x2 L2. Now we need to do this uh, minimum. Well, we know how to do that. Is this uh, reaction here? That's the minimum of L1 and L2. Now you get a K. And then we do the subtraction. Well, fortunately, we know that Y is bigger than K. So we can use this uh, instruction that says, take a, take, uh, basically kill as many Ys as there are Ks. Uh, zero means to kill them. And so this will uh, effectively subtract uh, uh, K from Y. And you end up with this expression here. But uh, so this is an implementation of maximum, but it's kind of different because it's, this is all concurrent or this reaction fire concurrently in, in the soup. It's not sequential like this expression here. So the fact that this is a correct implementation is already a, a bit non-trivial. Okay. And we can also do uh, you know, proper algorithms like this is the approximate majority algorithm from, from distributed computing, which you may be familiar with in this, in this conference. And uh, we can write this as a, I, I will come back to this later, but you can write this as four chemical reactions and, uh, and you can uh, you know, implement this majority algorithm. So, um, so these are simple programs, but in fact, uh, the, 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 the computational power of this uh, framework is, is quite, it's quite large. Uh, in fact, we can program uh, uh, not, not every algorithm, but approximately every algorithm is a CRN in the following sense. So a CRN again is a finite set of reactions over a finite set of species. Uh, and this is not truly complete because it's very much like Petri nets, the finite set of tokens or finite set of transitions. And Petri nets are, uh, are reachable. Uh, uh, the, uh, the reachability is decidable. So um, it's not truly complete. But unlike Petri nets, uh, CRNs have rates. 
And so rates actually give you more power um, because we can approximate uh, to incompleteness to an arbitrary error. Uh, so how does that work? So imagine, imagine trying to show the serenity are too incomplete. You could try to, for example, to implement a register machine to see if you can, you can do that. If you can do that, then, then you know it's too incomplete. Um, and, uh, and a register machine has registers are one or two and so on. You, you, there are this instruction increment the register and jump to instruction J and the next instruction and decrement, uh, decrement the register. If the register is greater than zero, do something. If the register is equal to zero, do something else. Well, for each one of these instructions, we can find a similar reaction. So this one is so we use the a species as a program counter. So if you're here, what exactly one molecule of PCI, you are, you are at instruction I. And if an instruction high, you, you produce a new R1 molecule, so increment R1, and you, and you move to PCJ by creating a, the program counter for J. At the same time, you're removing this program counter for I, so now you're at J, you keep doing this. But you run into trouble when you try to do test for zero, because uh, there is no way chemically to test for the absence of a molecule. Uh, so, so here we're stuck. However, we have rates. So uh, having rates means you have some notion of speed, and if you if you wait long enough, you know the longer you wait, the more sure you are that there are no molecules if you've never seen them. So this gives you an approximation. You can approximate test for zero by waiting long enough, and and it's still not trivial. But by this trick, you can then set an error bound that you want to achieve, and you do not know how long the computation is because that, that's undecidable. It's a Turing computation, but still you can you can set a, set an error bound, arrange, arrange things so that uh, uh, this error you get from test for zero over the whole computation remains below the fixed threshold. And therefore you can approximate the uh, Turing completeness. So this is uh, shown in this paper here. Um, now, um, of course, if you, um, uh, you can get more power by adding uh, a, a tape. Uh, in fact, you know, DNA is a tape. So if you had the polymerization, if you had the ability to, to, to chain molecules into polymers and, and form tapes, then you're fully Turing complete. But that's beyond the, the, the simple uh, you know, CRN uh, framework. Uh, but no, more often than trying to you know, implement a Turing machine in, in this, this area, we more often try to build the dynamical systems. Uh, so this is a different notion of computational uh, capability. And uh, what is a dynamical system? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's given by a set of differential equations. For example, this one here in the corner is a dynamical system that comes from the equation, the, equation, uh, the equation of motion of the simple pendulum. So theta is the angular of the pendulum. So you have a, a, a second time derivative on the left here, in this case. And on the right, you have something funny like a trigonometric function or something, some other funny, funny function. So this, this dynamical system can be very weird. But uh, there, there is a collection of them, which is called the elementary dynamical system, which are not elementary at all. They're, they're very complicated. And they include, uh, it's written down here, they include all the uh, ODEs that on the right-hand side, they have polynomials, but also trigonometry, exponentials, fractions, uh, and their inverses. So all of these are called the, um, elementary dynamical systems, but they include uh, uh, most of physics, uh, probably everything you've ever heard of, they include all of electronics and include all of bio, uh, bio, biochemistry because uh, with fractions, for example, you can do uh, Hill's uh, reaction laws uh, and exponents and so on. So they really include pretty much anything you want to worry about. Um, and any such elementary dynamical system can be uh, reduced to a simple CRN by a sequence of steps. This is a little algorithm. I will not describe the steps in detail, but just give an idea of what's involved. So let's start with something a little bit simpler than this uh, pendulum. Starts with the uh, sine and cosine oscillation. Well, you would write this as this uh, set of differential equations. The, the derivative of the sine is the cosine. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. So these two, two uh, equations give you uh, the sine cosine oscillation. Now, if we want to implement this uh, in some kind of chemical sense, the first problem is that uh, sine and cosine, they go negative and you cannot have negative concentrations of molecules. So first we need to make things uh, uh, positive. Uh, so, so the first step is to go from uh, 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 a set of differential equations, polynomial set of differential equations, to uh, polynomial equation in the, in the positive quadrant. And that can be done by splitting every variable into two. And then you consider, and then you have uh, two positive variables and you encode negative value as the difference of two positive variables. So you split C into C plus C minus and you split S into S plus S minus. And now we can rewrite this uh, differential system into a new one, which has in fact the same solutions. 
Um, and now we're in a be better position. So this is uh, uh, the second step. So, the, so, so step zero, step zero is to go from this weird uh, elementary systems to just polynomial systems. So this is a step called polynomization. And all elementary ODEs can be uh, uh, converted to pure polynomial ODEs by adding variables. I'm not telling you how to do that, but you just add more variables. And then you get a polynomial system like the one we have here. Then the next step is to this, this positivation. So you, you, any polynomial ODE system can be reduced to exact, these are all exact reductions and not approximations, uh, to a polynomial ODEs in the positive quadrants as differences. Uh, then the next step is to go from this now simple polynomial positive uh, ODE to chemical reactions. And that's done by translating each monomial on the right hand side to a, to a reaction. And that's done by a process called uh, Hungarization because it was discovered by a couple of Hungarian guys and not, that's what we, what we called it now. Um, and, uh, and that involves uh, taking any, um, uh, any Hungarian ODE, there's some restrictions, but you take any Hungarian ODEs, you take the left hand side, uh, uh, monomials, if each monomial can produce a reaction. Now, technically, this process uh, requires a special form of ODEs, which are called Hungarian. But if you go through the first two steps, you automatically get an ODE in, in that form. So we don't have to worry about that. So it just works. Uh, so we can go from here to a uh, set of chemical reactions. And then the final step, now that we have this uh, chemical reaction network, now this is, these are S's and, and C's and and these are not real molecules. We don't even know. You know, they're not oxygen or carbon or anything. They're just uh, abstract uh, symbols. So how do we go from this chemical reaction network to actual molecules? Well, this is with really part two of the of the talk. So let's let's delay that for a bit. But we can get to real molecules. And of course, now we can go back as well. We can go from our uh, chemical reaction network, apply the low the low mass action. We get a set of differential equations. And this differential equation, if you massage it a little bit, you get back the original, the original system. So we know we're, we're doing the right thing. Okay, so this is, uh, again, take uh, any dynamical system and get uh, pretty much and get a chemical reaction network. Um, so, so we have a programming language. We have discussed it, so it's pretty powerful. Uh, so what is the meaning of this programming language? What is the semantics? So for the, uh, there are two meanings really. There is a stochastic meaning that comes from the looking at, uh, uh, our species as, as a finite collection of molecules. So uh, the atomic theory of matter, there, there, are, there are atoms. Uh, and the other point of view is that uh, concentration are continuous. So there are no atoms, it's just a smooth uh, concentration. Um, and that's what the point of view you take in dynamical system that thinks it's, I mean, it's continuous. Uh, in, the, in the case of uh, uh, stochasticity, you can just use like better nest to model the discrete behavior of these systems. For continuous behavior, uh, you differential equations. So the semantics, the continuous semantics is a bit different, but you can write it as a, as a form of semantics. So this is our, in this funny bracket, is our programming language. A is the species, R is the reactions, X0 are initial conditions for, for the species. And then also have a volume and a temperature because that also may influence the reactions. So we want to have the meaning of this program uh, written in the funny brackets. And the meaning of this program is obtained by integration. You start from the initial conditions and you integrate the flux, which is the right hand side of the differential equations that you can derive from the chemical reactions by the low mass action. So you integrate the flux over time. And then at any, at any time t, you get uh, the value of the concentrations of all the species at that time. So you can get the final state if you stop at a certain time, you can get the final, you can compute the final state of the system after a certain time. Uh, H is a time horizon to avoid, to avoid some technical issues. Uh, but basically, at any time t, you can get uh, the value of the concentration of time t, and this is the the meaning. This is the deterministic meaning. Uh, so, given initial uh, condition, you get a unique solution that's deterministic. However, there is also another semantics of chemical reaction, which is the stochastic, the uh, continuous stochastic semantics, and this is uh, um, given first uh, in uh, uh, the proper way to do this is called the, the chemical master equation which is the Kolmogorov forward equation of the Markov chain produced by the CRN, which is a continuous set of differential equations talking about uh, how, how uh, the, uh, uh, the distributions of, uh, of species change over time. So it tells how, how the distributions change, it's a stochastic in that sense. But the, this set of, although it is a true, it's a true semantics, uh, it's unfeasible to solve the, the master equation or even simulate it, even for very, very small systems. So it's, it's completely out of the question. 
Um, the Gillespie algorithm allows you to produce individual samples of the CME distribution. So that's the way you typically approach it, but you, get, you just get sample, you, you don't easily get the full distribution unless you try and you know, do lots and lots of samples. But there is another semantic which I like very much, which is the uh, so-called LNA semantic, the Lear noise approximation. And this is a, is a Gaussian semantic. So now we worry about not just the, uh, the, the, the deterministic behavior, which we now call the mean of the, of the concentration, but also we worry about the variance but not the higher moments of the, of the, of the distributions. So you, you, only, you only want to carry along the, the mean and the, vari and the variance of each, of, each, of each species. And for that, we can write a very similar semantics to the one we had before. We have our programming language here. And on the right-hand side now, we have this Gaussian state that has means and, and, and covariances for all the, across all the species. And the means are exactly the ones we had before, the same integration, just different names, but the same integral for the means. So the, the mean behavior does not change, but we also have a, 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 an integral for the variances. So we can compute all the variances by this uh, harder integral instead of the flux with uh, the, the Jacobian of the flux and there's some more terms, but we can have a similar uh, integration process. So in fact, we can give this uh, entire uh, set of the mean equation and the, and the variance equations it, 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 as a whole, the set of differential equations. We just send, uh, give this to an ODE solver and to solve both the means and, and, and the variance and the covariances at the same time. So this way we can easily compute uh, the covariance. It's uh, just ODE, just integrate is very fast uh, as opposed to the CME, which is basically unfeasible. So this is uh, what I like very much. My, my, my own tools are based on, on this kind of meaning, which is very easy to execute. It's an approximation, sorry, I should say that. It's an approximation, but we know how the approximation behaves uh, with respect to the true, true solution. Now, uh, all this can also be related to uh, process algebra and uh, uh, stochastic system that we're more familiar with. Uh, we'll not go through that, but uh, so there is continuous chemistry, differential equation, discrete chemistry, basically Markov chains. And we can relate Markov chains to process algebra, for example. We know how to translate back and forth across all these things. Uh, some, sometimes you have a combinatorial explosion, sometimes you have approximations, but they're all connected. And so we can, you know, we can understand this. Uh, and for example, you can get uh, the ODE meaning of a process algebra by going through this translation and then go to continuous chemistry and you get some bunch of ODEs that represent the continuous behavior of the process algebra, which is kind of fun, but uh, well, that's, that's something we can do. Now, uh, finally, I should, I should mention some, some bad programs uh, in addition to the good programs I've showed you before. Um, because things are, when you talk about actual physics, things are a bit uh, delicate. So first of all, if my program is S goes to Y, it's already violating thermodynamics uh, right away, because thermodynamics says that uh, every reaction must have a, a, an inverse reaction. Okay? So, but this you can you know, fix uh, by saying, oh, there is a very tiny uh, inverse reaction that we don't care about. So we, we can just uh, talk about forward, uh, forward reaction, basically irreversible reactions. Uh, a bit more serious is the fact that when you write this program that, that uh, violates conservation of mass. You know, from one atom, you get two atoms for free. So this doesn't happen. But again, here you can think this is an abbreviation for A plus X goes X plus X. So we have a, a, a mass reservoir A from which you, you will obtain the mass that you need to produce this additional mass on the right hand side. So again, this is not a big problem. But then you have things like this. Uh, this is really bad because this violates finite density. This, uh, this is the solution of this uh, uh, chemical reaction. Uh, this reaches infinite concentration in finite time. So, so well, so this will, uh, if you run this, uh, it will make a black hole. Okay, okay, so black holes are real. So in a sense, you can, there is a sense in which you can implement this by producing a black hole, but you don't want to do that in your lab. So um, this is uh, something, unfortunately, of course, uh, trying to detect the, the CRN, which by the finite density is undecidable. So there is not much you can do about that. And, and so you're, you're stuck with it. Right, so, uh, so to conclude uh, chemistry, this first, this first part, chemistry is, uh, is an observational science, but also it's a programming language, a formal language that we can use to implement algorithms and also dynamical systems. And uh, it, we'll see later how to do that for real with real molecules. So it is Turing complete in this approximate sense. It's also you know, Shannon complete in the sense of doing an analog computation. Uh, and any collection of after chemical reactions can be implemented with a special design molecule. And this is uh, what we're gonna see in the next uh, uh, step. The, the, good, uh, the good outcome of all of this is that we can approach a situation we have a, uh, a programming language, which is chemical reaction, which we can systematically compile uh, to molecules. 
uh, and then we can go into the lab and produce those molecules and let them react and see what they produce, read out the result of those uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of that execution, and then we can. After reading out the execution, we can uh, discover what happened and we can design the next experiment and, and go back into a closed loop and maybe have a closed loop of experimentation and, and modeling in this way. So and this can be um, hopefully entirely automated. Uh, you know, uh, so the lab is completely robotic and the, the CRN is produced by artificial intelligence and you, and you cook the whole thing together and you do experiments uh, automatically. Okay, so that's one of the uh, uh, ideas. So summarizing, uh, so our models uh, that we are considered here are chemical programs. We can compute their behavior in the sense of their final state at any time t. We can run it virtual through to integration of the ODEs, and, and we also run it physically um, using, as you will see in the next, next by DNA nanotech. So good. Now part two, um, how do we go from a, this uh, kind of abstract chemical reaction network where you have X, Y, and Z, and W, which mean they're not molecules, they're just symbols. How do you go from that to a set of molecules that, that does the same thing as the chemical reaction network uh, in the sense of the, the trajectories that it produces? Uh, so this can be done not with any molecules, but we can do it with DNA molecules. And that's why DNA computing is, uh, is important because DNA is programmable. So we can, we can program these DNA molecules to do what we want them to do. So because if I, if I write my own program, chemical program, which has these X, Y, and Z, and Ws, and then I go to a chemist or a postdoc in chemistry, and I say, can you please implement this, this reaction in your, in your lab? Well, he will say, well, what, how do I do that? I mean, how, where do I go in nature and find this, uh, this X, Y, and Z, and Ws that behave in this way? There is, the, there is no way. Well, actually, there is a way, um, but it's not, it's not obvious. Uh, so if you write, if you have molecular language is not obviously executable. Um, so we want to execute it with real molecules uh, that we can design ourselves and you can buy on the web. You can you know, buy molecules and run and uh, get them by mail and, by, and, and then execute in your lab. So this is done by a technique called DNA strand displacement it can be done this way. This is an unnatural use of DNA as far as we know. Um, DNA does not do this uh, process of strand displacement. It's possible that RNA we think does a little bit of that, but it's, it's very specific. Um, uh, DNA is basically uh, stores programs uh, and it doesn't have, does not have much dynamics. Uh, with this, uh, the idea of strand displacement, we actually introduce dynamics into DNA and we make DNA execute in, in a way which is not natural uh, typically. Uh, and we can do this for any system of chemical reactions with real DNA molecules. So, uh, so DNA is a, is a long, as you know, probably know, is a long uh, sequence of four letters. Um, and each subsequence in this long sequence, we can call it domain. We call it a, a domain if domains are uh, mutually disjoint in the sense that they do not interact or not interact easily with each other because DNA can stick to, each, to itself by complementarity. So a domain is by definition something that does not stick to another domain. In any, in, any, in any significant way. Um, so domains are uh, uh, orthogonal independent subsequences of, of, a, of a long DNA uh, sequence. And so if we have a long DNA sequence CTGA like this one here, uh, we can spin to domains X, Y, and Z. Uh, of course, we have to design these domains so that do not stick to each other. And there are algorithms for doing that as well. But let's assume that we have, we know how to do that. So we, if we can do this partition into domain, then, then we can forget about the sequence and we can just work at the domain level, which, which is what I will do. But there is always this step to go from the domains to the actual sequences that have this property of not sticking. And that's another step we have to do, but you know, we know how to do that. To do that. So DNA is, is, a, is an oriented sequence. So it goes from left to right in this case, or from three prime to five prime as the, as the chemist would say. Um, and, uh, and we have this uh, subdivision in domains. Now we're going to use two different kinds of domains, so-called short ones and long ones. The short ones are basically six, ba six bases, so six letters, very short. And uh, they're, uh, they're such that uh, if there is a complementary domain for this uh, short T domain, so the, the complementary one is written with the arrow going the other way. So this would be actually T star, you know, T, T complement. Uh, be complementary to D. If you have a, a domain, a complementary domain, then they will stick to each other by complementarity. And if they're short, then thermal noise is enough to break them apart again. 
Uh, so by definition, uh, if you in, in normal lab condition, normal temperatures and concentrations, uh, this this length of domains will uh, automatically disassemble as well as assemble. So this is a re reversible reaction. It's called hybridization when you when you have this complementation. So a reversible hybridization. You go from two single strands with double strand in this notation here, where the top strand uh, would be the T and the bottom strand would be T complement. Now the long domains. Uh, as, are long enough that in normal conditions, when they complement each other, they stick to each other and, they, and thermal noise is no longer able to break them apart. So this is now an irreversible reaction. Again, this is not real thermodynamics, but we can assume that um, the, the buckle reaction is too slow. So this is irreversible reaction. Uh, X and X complement make a, a double strand. Now, DNA strand displacement is when you replace one of these strands with another one. And you, and you replace them by displacement. So you start, uh, it's a little movie here. So this is DNA. Let's unroll it to, uh, to see better what's happening. And uh, on one hand uh, of, uh, these are all the bases. On one hand, we have a, a sticking a bit that sticks out on, on a single strand, the red bit. There's only a single strand here, not a double strand. And you have an invading single strand that binds to the toehold. This red region here is called the toehold. And then the, this strand, the invading strand is the same sequence as one of the uh, double strands. So we can replace it step by step because it's just identical. The sequence is the same. And this is a random walk. It, it can go, it will go back and forth for a long time, but the random walk eventually will get to the end and will detach the original strand. And now we have replaced the original strand, which did not have the toehold, with a slightly longer strand, which has the toehold, which now complements the, the full DNA and, and, the, and the same copy. Now, it seems, it seems to be a bit pointless because we are replacing a strand with an equal one, but actually we can use that to, to do computation. So, the, uh, so the, again, schematically, this is strand displacement. You have a, a double strand uh, with a, a top strand X. We have a toehold T complement because it's on the bottom. And we have a, 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 an invading strand, which is a toehold T and the X uh, at the top. So the first step is to bind the toehold. That happens by, and this is reversible. Remember, toeholds are short, so this is reversible. Uh, but then strand displacement begins. So you're replacing one with the other, and they're the same X. So and again, random walk, but when it gets to the end, it detaches the original strand. And now this one no longer has a hold, so basically cannot go back. And now we have an irreversible release of the original strand. Now, what happens if the top strand, the, if the invading strand is not equal to the uh, double strand? Well, suppose they are equal up to X and then this is Z and that is W, they become different. Then the toehold binds, X displaces, then it gets here and suppose the first uh, nucleotide is different and it, it's just one of them, if it's different, it's enough to stop the process. So if it's different here, it will stop. It cannot go forward. It's a random walk, so it has to go backwards. And so it will have to go back and dissociate because the last step is reversible. So basically, if you have a, if you have a good match, you, you have an irreversible transition. If you have a bad match, you have a, a no op. You have, nothing happens, basically. You reverse and nothing happens. So this is good. Um, now we can use a, a specific architecture to combine these uh, notions into a computation steps. Uh, in this architecture, uh, there are gates and there are signals. So a signal is, uh, is this structure here, is a toehold to bind things. And, and then a, and the recognition agent, so X will be your signal meaning. X will, be, will mean that you've seen something in the environment, for example, and you produce this total X uh, as a signal. And then there will be gates that pro processes the signals. And the gate will have this structure. It's a double-stranded DNA, but it has gaps uh, for toeholds. So there's gaps where these uh, signal strands can bind and, and produce something. So, but again, it's a double strand with, uh, with the bottom strand is contiguous, uh, but the top strand has interactions and gaps. Now uh, let's see an example of a, uh, how, how to do something. A simple computation step to transduce a signal X to an unrelated signal Y, a simple transduction. So the input is this TX and we're gonna need all this thing here to do the transduction. Uh, which includes some double strands and also some single strands to, as, as helpers. So the inputs uh, here binds to this uh, toehold here to start with, and it begins to displace this X, which is the same X as the input. And this gets to this place here where it, uh, uh, the original strand only hangs by another toehold, so this will detach. And now we've opened up a new toehold for this uh, new invading strand to, to bind. And this was there already uh, as part of the gate, but this now can enter and this place is new signal AT. 
At this point, we already, in a sense, transduce x to a, but the toehold is on the wrong side we, because we want all the, all the signals to be uniform for compositionality. So the, the, the rest of the process is to basically put the hold, the hold back on the, on the correct side. So this we do by the second half of the structure, which now goes uh, from right to left instead of left to right. So this uh, 80 was going to bind uh, to this 80 here. So the toehold to hold binds there and displaces the A backwards in this case and releases TA. This again opens up a new to hold for this uh, prepared strand YT. Now the, the to hold can enter and displace Y. And now we have TY and TY is our output. Now the to hold on the correct side and we have Y, which is what we wanted. Uh, at this point though, all, the, all of this is reversible. This could all, could all go back to the beginning. So we need to clamp down the, the system to, to get our output for real. And also the other problem we have is that we produce this garbage here. Because of these strands that could uh, do not actually <clears throat> break things, but if you let them accumulate, eventually they will uh, <clears throat> slow down the process and they will make the system go backwards or forward. So we want to get rid of the garbage as well. We can do both things at the same time, get rid of the garbage and clamp down the, the, the gate. Um, because this garbage um, can bind to this uh, region here where this X is there for that purpose. So binds there and releases a, a, a strand, a single strand, but with no two holes. We imagine that's uh, inherently relevant because it has no two holes to bind to anything. And similarly, this garbage here can bind here and displace an A, which again has no two hole. And that's the final state. Now the, the system is, there are no two holes. So the system is clamped down. It cannot react anymore. Uh, it's just full double strands. And we have the, the, the only active uh, signal is this TA, TY, the output. And we have some some electrode that doesn't matter. Now, the what something to notice is that the the energy for this computational step comes from from uh, consuming the gate. So that's the only energy input. There there is no ATP. There is no uh, thermal cycling. This is completely autonomous. You just mix the gates and the inputs and it, and it runs. And the energy comes from using up the gates. Uh, pure 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 entropy energy. So so this. Uh, works with pure DNA. There are no proteins, there are no enzymes, there's no heat cycling. We just mix things in salty water and the thing uh, works. Okay, uh, there is concurrency, as I mentioned. So I'll just give you a little movie to show some of the concurrent aspects. So the same transducers, X comes and uh, produces the linker A, and then A goes to the other half, so do it again. And there is some concurrency in the way T's and A's uh, move around. Um, this is I show you because the next step is to show you a real reaction and just sort of a transducer. So we want to do chemical reaction networks, remember? So we want to do things of the kind of X plus Y goes to S plus W. If you can do this, you can do everything. So just if you can do two to two, you can do any reaction, um, any reaction network. Uh, so now we have two inputs, but we use the same scheme exactly. Instead of having one input, we have two inputs. You just chain them on, on, the, on the first half of, this, of the structure. So a completely uniform structure as before. So you change the, the, the two inputs. So your first input X uh, that opens up this to hold, which allows Y to bind, which then opens up this to hold and allows the linker that we saw before to go to the second half. And in the second half, we get this uh, linker from the first half that means that all the inputs have been received. And when all of them have been received, then you, you go uh, right, to, right to left to, and you uh, basically detach all the outputs that you need uh, this way. So in fact, here you can have not just two and two, you can have N inputs and M outputs with completely uniform structure. You can implement any molecularity of, of reaction uh, this way. And uh, the, the garbage collection may become a little bit more complicated, but you can have some additional structure that do the full garbage collection, even in these more complicated cases. So the, uh, just again, the little movie, you get the two inputs, uh, shuffle, shuffle, the linker goes there and, and produces in this case, just one output. And then there's some garbage collection. Uh, there is one trick here, though, that uh, uh, this reaction here, uh, the meaning is that if you have X and no Y, the reaction should not fire. And similarly, if you have Y but no X, the reaction should not fire. In particular, if you, if you have X and, never, and you never get Y, you should, you should not capture X because X may be needed in some other place. So um, when, when uh, in this initial step here, when X binds here, X bind reversibly, and that's important uh, because if, in, if Y never comes, uh, then this uh, this uh, uh, this uh, 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 this X we have displaced can go back because it has a to hold. 
So it can go back and displace back the, the TX. So TX will unbind reversibly. So if you have uh, so so reversibility in so reversibility is fundamental. You, you cannot do this without reversible reactions. You also need to have the reversible reactions as well. And it's essential to do this uh, uh, trick of being able to not absorb X when, when Y never comes. So that's important to, to mention. Okay, so um, so this we can be done, we can do for real. So again, we have we can take a real argument that our proxy majority, we can call this as the string instructions. This uh, X plus Y goes to undecided, undecided. If it finds X uh, becomes like X, if it finds Y becomes like Y, this is a majority algorithm. And uh, you, you probably know about this uh, in this context. Uh, it is a, it's an optimal algorithm that runs very fast. Uh, it has an interesting behavior. Um, and we can do this for real in the lab. So you can, you can take these four and uh, three reactions. We can convert them to uh, strand displacement structures, as I just showed you. And we can uh, mix them up in, into a lab, and you get uh, and this is an experimental result. Uh, so the, the 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 thick line is the model, the ODE model, and the thin line, the, the dashed line, is the experimental result. You can see that the X wins the majority when it starts from from some some initial majority. Um, so here are some examples of what people can do uh, with these state of the art uh, computations, if you want, in this uh, DNA model. Uh, this is a, a paper describing how to to compute the square root of a four bit number. This is something you can do with a, a few hundred uh, you know, DNA strands. Um, uh, similarly, they people built uh, artificial neural networks uh, using gates made of DNA, uh, where you can classify four distinct four-bit patterns uh, via uh, some artificial neurons made of DNA. Uh, this is a different, uh, instead of a, uh, instead of a, a, um, a, a neural network, this is a, is a winner-take-all network. Uh, so different kind of uh, neural network where you can classify uh, uh, digits, the, you know, the 10 digits, uh, uh, you can uh, classify them. So this is again, you know, state of the art, uh, the co complexity of the networks that people can build at the moment. And to scale beyond that, uh, people are beginning to build uh, circuit boards where you can build a DNA uh, a circuit boards where you can make the addressable arrays of DNA where you can address uh, structures to specific locations in this array. And then you can bind gates to this uh, uh, circuit board, and so you can localize the gates. So lo by localizing the gates on, on this uh, on the surface, you avoid the uh, long long range interactions that could could hurt you, uh, that could mess up things. Uh, and the final thing I want to mention is that uh, the, the the fact of clocks. So if you if you imagine doing doing things like in electronics, you have circuits and gates and so on. Usually those are clock circuits. But uh, clocks in biology and biochemistry, they're very difficult to make because they're very expensive, use lots of energy, lots of materials. They have to run all the time. They have to go everywhere. So the, your, your laptop gets hot because it has clocks that run all the time. Biology does not have, I mean, there, there are long-time clocks like the circadian that, that runs once a day or so. Something like that. But you do not have, you know, uh, nanosecond, millisecond or, or microsecond clocks. So, but we can do asynchronous computing. We can build uh, Mueller C elements uh, that allow us to do asynchronous computation like you, you have in your, your cell phone that, that has the same, use the same techniques to avoid uh, getting too hot. Uh, so we can do asynchronous uh, uh, logic gates and, and, and do computation that way. Right, so now let's go to the, uh, the actual uh, topic of the, of, the, of the talk, which is uh, the algorithm for detecting molecular events. Now I'll explain how all these things work here. So what we want to do in, um, we, in a typical experiment, you want to know what's going on in the experiment. Uh, this could be a, a natural experiment where you want to know what's going on, or it could be a, a synthetic you know, biotechnology experiment. You want to know what, what went wrong because typically it goes wrong. Uh, so you want to know what is the sequence of events that led to a particular outcome. And the sequence is important because you want to determine causation typically, and, and you, don't, you don't get uh, that without some notion of order. So I'll discuss a, a, an algorithm which, algorithm which uh, is I call it a pre-order recorder that records the pre-order of, uh, of first occurrence of a set of events uh, in, a, in a chemical soup. And what is an event? So an event is the appearance, the occurrence of a, a DNA or RNA strand in the soup. And this event, this, uh, this occurrence of a DNA or RNA strand could be a, a circuit, a, a signal in a circuit, just the one I, I just described. Or it could be some naturally transcribed RNA, like RNA is being transcribed over time in the genome. So you can see that as, as, a, as a, an event when a new RNA, a message RNA is being produced. So you may want to de detect the order of, uh, 
occurrence of messenger RNAs, uh, or it could be some DNA strand you produce uh, as a detector. If you want to identify some molecule in the environment, for example, you can, uh, there are ways to produce DNA strands that recognize the, that molecule, and then you have a DNA signal that you can count as an event, and then, then go on from there. Uh, so um, just to summarize again, we have uh, 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 domains, which are DNA subsequences. Uh, we have this model of uh, using short domain and long domains to do computations with, uh, with inputs and, and gates. Uh, gates are also called fuel because they're consumed during the computation and you get the output and you get waste, which is uh, inert. So that's uh, again, summarizing the model. And typically, how do you read the how do you read the, out the results of this kind of computations? Well, the typical thing to do is to use a, a fluorophore. So you can buy DNA with a, with fluorophores already attached to, to them. So you have fluorophore on one strand and a quencher to the other strand. When these are close to each other, the quencher absorbs the photons that the fluorophores produces, so you do not see anything. But if you do a strand displacement, you detach the fluorophore from the quencher, and now you're going to see the photons that the the, the fluorophore is producing. And now you can you can tell that this happened that this step happened because now you see fluorescence. So so the typical thing to do is to do fluorescence readout. Another other things you can do is to do use a microscope, a particular atomic force microscope to actually look at the at the structure of the molecules. That's even, that's possible, uh, amazingly enough. Um, you can actually get pictures of uh, of your molecules, uh, and that can also tell you what what's been happening, especially if you're building structures. You can see what kind of structures we built. Uh, and another way, however, is to do sequencing. So you take the, your whole soup of, of chemicals, and let's assume it's a soup of DNA molecules, and you sequence it uh, by a standard sequencing process, and you can read out everything which is in your soup, or at least all the DNA or RNA which is in your soup. So that's another way to get an output. It's, it's like a core dump as opposed to as opposed to a, a trace like would be the fluorescence. So you get a core dump of your system, and then you can, and a core dump is not, uh, it doesn't tell about the order of events. So so that's another difficulty. You just get an idea of what, what, what is the final state or maybe some intermediate state. But uh, and so if you want to get an order, you have to take mul multiple intermediate states to see what's happening. Um, but what, what you can do, you can, you can as, as the computation progresses, you can recall your computation into the, your state. So when you, at the end, when you, when you read out the state, you also read out some history of the computation. And this is the idea that we're gonna use here. So how does sequencing work? Well, so a long story, but uh, um, uh, historically sequences was done by the Sanger method, which is uh, for, if you want to read the sequence, you, you build uh, all the possible sub sequences and you, you, uh, you flag each one by different color, depending on the, the last, uh, the last uh, uh, base. So now you can tell by, for each length, what is the, by each color, what is the final nucleotide so you can read the sequence. But these days, uh, uh, the sequence is not done, you know, one side at a time is done in massively in parallel. You can have uh, chips with, uh, with a whole loan of uh, sequen uh, sequences on the, using the same idea as Sanger, but you can do all that in, in parallel. And also you can do uh, nanopore sequencing where you can thread DNA strands through a, a nanopore, which uh, by changing the electric field, uh, reading the electric field of the, of the strand going through, you can detect uh, the, which bases are going through and you can read out uh, the sequence this way. So you know, you can have uh, these days up 200 of these uh, nanopores in parallel in a single device. You can you can do a 200 reading parallel very fast because the network will move very fast across. In fact, it moves. You have to slow down because it moves too fast. Um, and what about uh, synthesis? So 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 se sequencing we cannot do massively parallel. There is similar uh, uh, technology to ma massive uh, sequencing, as uh, massive synthesis. Synthesis. So, and this is done again by um, silicon technology. You can build silicon chips with the same techniques they use for silicon chips. That contains a whole uh, arrays of uh, 9600 different DNA strands. And then you can use that to, to synthesize new strands uh, uh, on, top of, on top of this uh, silicon chip. So again, no details, but you can do this in massively parallel. Another way is to produce uh, DNA, to synthesize DNA, Instead of doing you know step by step adding one base at a time in these chemical processes, you can use bacteria to do it for you. And bacteria are very very good at making high high quality, much higher quality DNA than we can do synthetically. So this way, the way you do it, you insert you you, you prepare your DNA painfully by by joining together short pieces of DNA which is synthesized piece by piece because the synthesis you can only 
do fairly short pieces. So you chase them together to get your, your long DNA. But then once you have one copy of it, you can give it to a bacterial colony and it will make automatically many, multi, many, 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 you know, billions and billions of copies of that with incredibly high fidelity. So this way you can build a, a huge amounts of high, very high quality DNA that it's uh, important for uh, computational purposes. So the, the pace of biotechnology uh, is such that uh, this is more slow on a logarithmic scale. So it looks uh, linear, uh, decreasing because it's the cost uh, of, uh, of uh, sequencing in this case. So more slow is, uh, is here for comparison. And the other curve is the cost of sequencing, which goes exponential on top of, of a logarithmic uh, graph. So the uh, so sequencing is, is, has been proceeding double exponentially from 2000. Uh, eight or so as a technology. So, so it, although it is uh, still slow and expensive, you know, it's moving, moving very, very fast. And, uh, and synthesis follows more closely moves law, but again, it's an exponential law. So, so things will move up uh, quite dramatically in the future. So we have these technologies, which are going to become very exciting in the near future. And we want to use them uh, as a mass sequences and mass, uh, and mass uh, uh, synthesis. Uh, to do uh, interesting things. And so you, you start thinking, well, what can I do with these uh, new technologies which, are, which allow, allow us to do mass sequencing and mass synthesis uh, uh, more than just speeding up things? Can, can, we, can we devise new algorithms that take advantage of this uh, new, uh, new mass technology uh, that to do things in a more interesting ways than just doing you know, sequ sequentially one, one thing at a time? Um, and so this is what uh, I basically set out to do, try to find some algorithms that take advantage of this technology. And um, uh, as I mentioned, we can use this uh, uh, notion of domains and, and domain uh, computation to implement chemical reactions. There are actually many different schemes of doing that and have different properties. For example, the so-called three domain scheme is similar to what I described, but it has uh, this uh, bit sticking out of the DNA. So this is not possible to, to sequence because it's not DNA of the form that sequencer will accept. And also not possible to clone because bacteria don't know how to do, don't know what to do with these sticking out bits. So this is an example of a technology for DNA computing, which is not clonable and not sequenceable. Uh, the, the technology I described is called two domain scheme. And it's such that everything looks like a, a double strand. It has, so it has, inter it has gaps, but those we can fix. So this actually we can sequence uh, with some uh, caveats. And we also we can use bacteria to produce it. The bacteria will not produce the gaps, the, the, but we can use uh, um, enzymes after the fact to introduce the gaps where we want them to uh, occur. So we can we can do this uh, with bacteria and then and then and add the gaps. But but this is not uh, still not by default uh, sequenceable because um, uh, this is the initial state, and this will be the final state when it's fully complemented. And if you if you do sequences, you have to do uh, extension of the of the gaps. You have to do ligation to remove the uh, the, the the mix. So after uh, extension and ligation, the output will look exactly like input, and the sequencer will not be able to distinguish input from output. So in this sense, this uh, this scheme here, this particular transducer, this is a transducer, is not sequenceable because you cannot distinguish the output from the input. So. Um, let me give uh, so uh, I'll give an example of a sequenceable gate. Um, this is using a new trick. Uh, we have a, a sequenceable join, so it takes two inputs, and we want to detect the occurrence of uh, the fact that the two inputs have arrived. So again, we get the first input and the second input, and then there is a, a new trick. Let me show how, how the new trick works. So, so in the first step, the first input comes and displaces the uh, the first strand at eight or eight t eight or hold. And opens up a new the new the new gap. Sorry, I'm, I'm switching notation here. The the arrowheads are the nicks. So this is a nick, this is a nick, and the pluses are the domain boundaries, which are not no nicks there. So the arrowheads are nicks or the end of the sequence. So now there is a gap here. The second input comes and uh, gets released, and now uh, this whole structure here can bind the, from this to hold to that to hold and do displacement, displacing this Q, and stick this whole structure to the end. Uh, this is called uh, now four-way branch dis displacement. Uh, it is difficult to visualize if you, don't, if you don't see a movie, but basically this bit replaces that bit. This Q detaches, the bottom Q detaches as well and binds to the, this other Q here. And so at the end, you had this structure here and that structure there. The point is that now the output 
is sequencing, sequencing distinguishable from the inputs because we have this additional R piece that you can sequence and tell that something happened. So now we can sequence, we, re, we can read ABQR, which is different from ABQ plus QR. That was the initial stage. So this is now, uh, we've accepted two inputs and we can tell that that happened by sequences. So, so now we can use this uh, to do something interesting. So the, uh, uh, given that gate, the, the, the sequenceable join gate, there was a simple algorithm, which is to detect the coincidence of two events. So we have a set of events, uh, maybe a small set, like you know, three or four or five or six. Um, you add to the soup all the join gates for, uh, for all these pairs of events. So you have joy for, uh, join for x1 and x2, join for x2 and x3, join for x1 and x1 as well. Uh, we have all the, all the possible n square joins of all possible events. And each, each join will tell you which pair of events has happened in the soup. And when you sequence the whole soup at the end, you can, you can tell which joins have happened just by reading the, the, the gates which have filed. So very simple algorithm is hardware and algorithm. You just mix all the stuff together and, and, and you're done. And then you sequence the whole pot. So this tells us uh, uh, what, 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 whether certain things have happened, but not the order in which, in which they happened. So for that, we can do something uh, else. Uh, basically, uh, here, well, here's a long specification, but basically now we want to implement this uh, new gate, which I call a choice gate. This is the reaction that we want to achieve. The choice gate has a, a choice B, has the following behavior. If there is a, a signal A, we want uh, A choice B to be converted to a new state, which means that A, a arrived before B. Instead, if B arrives first, then you want the same A choice B to be reduced to a state which has a B arise before A. So we want to find molecules that have this kind of meanings. And A, this is catalytic, so A is not consumed. So this will hopefully very quickly convert all the, all the choice gates to the output state before any, any B arise. And then we can tell that A is arrived before or long, long before B. Um, so this we can do by this uh, sequenceable structure. It has, uh, so the choice gate is made of two parts. And each part has two components. Uh, and it's using this trick of attaching this structure to the end. It's also clonable because it's you know, plain double stranded so, uh, uh, sequences. And the way this works is that, so we have this uh, structure of the choice gate. Now, if, if A arrives first, so let's say, let's say B arrives first. So B will bind into this to hold here. And so the red B replaces the, the blue B to hold. And this, this B to hold moves to the second half and binds there blocking that to hold now so nothing happened so a cannot bind there anymore and uh, and and by binding the blue b here we are displacing the green b so we have a uh, we had a red b in, in output we get back a blue b uh, a green b in input so we have not uh, uh, absorbed b we are reproduced b but now we have locked the gate we've locked both sides of the gate we have locked the, this half by the input we have locked the, the other half by uh, this translation, and so if if A arrives next, it cannot bind to the to the uh, to the part where it would bind if it arrives first. And now now we're in this uh, irreversible situation. And if we sequence this situation, we we read P A B Q R plus S P B I Q. Instead, if we if A arrives first, it will bind on this side on the right side first. It will do something that then binds to the left hand side blocking, and we end up in this situation here, where uh, we now sequence PBAQR plus SPABQ, which is different from that. So now we can tell which one of these two has arrived first, if they arrive you know, at a reasonable distance from each other. If they arrive together or, or close to your uh, uh, you know, time interval sensitivity, then you will produce both structures. But then you, your signal, you will tell you that both things have happened. So you can actually tell that things have happened at the same time or, or, close, or close to each other, because then you sequence both that and that. So to turn this into a, a, the, the recorder algorithm, again, you just uh, take all possible pairs of choice gates, uh, X and Y, uh, you mix them all the way in the soup, okay, N square gates, and, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, you reconstruct, you sequence the whole thing at the end, and then you reconstruct the order by transitive reduction, because uh, uh, in the output, you have all possible order relationships between two uh, signals. And we just uh, you know, trivial matter of reconstructing the pre-order from that. So it's a pre-order, by the way, because things can arrive, can arrive at the same time, which case is not a, it's not you know, an order; it's a pre-order. Okay, so and so in this case we have our gate, the choice gate. Uh, you have A A B B C C A B A C B C. If you have three events, these are the uh, the uh, twelve structures. 
And if you get the C input, some of this will convert to outputs. But if then you get uh, another input, it will convert uh, some of the remaining ones, but not the ones which have already been converted. And this 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 uh, did not get converted because A never arrives. So you can tell that A never arrived because uh, you have not reduced the structure. And this way you can reconstruct the, the pre-order. So, so this is uh, this is the end basically. Um, uh, what I should mention is that the choice gate, which I present here, is faulty by design. Uh, so uh, there can be cross talk between this gate. If you have a, a, a sorry, this is a um, oops. This is a uh, sorry. This means a choice B. This is a question mark here instead of the high record. So uh, if you have a choice B and B choice C. Uh, you, you will have cross talk between this gate and get gate uh, because some of the signals coming out of this will can bind uh, to the B on this gate but also the B on that gate. But uh, this does not hurt this particular algorithm because uh, if you're going to get a B, you're going to activate both gates anyway. So that doesn't matter in this case. So, so although, although this gate is fault because it has cross talk in the context of having all the possible pairs, it behaves uh, correctly anyway. Um, uh, you can get a, a correct choice gate which does not have this cross talk but that's more expensive in particular um, the good part about the fault gate is that it's only using order of n distinct domains so there are all the domains that you're using a b's and c's and no other domains except the two holes but if you want to use the correct uh, um, choice gate we're going to also need all the combinations of uh, new domains that represent the combination of signals but now you're going to have uh, n square plus n um, domains and that's really very bad experimental because you have, if you have uh, so many domains they, they will uh, uh, interact with each other in a way that you do not want so it, it's, it's a very good property to be able to uh, get along with only uh, order of n domains so still the correctness of the uh, of the algorithm is not, is not terrible because it's a concurrent algorithm and all kinds of weird things can happen race conditions uh, uh, deadlocks and so on so um, the um, the correctness, for example, of the two domain scheme was proved, uh, you know, two years after it was proposed by using a very sophisticated technique in pure concurrency. Um, so these these are not uh, uh, obvious, but so what I've done so far is to do simulations and make sure that things seem to work. Um, you, you got, sorry to interrupt because yeah. the session is already starting. Um, ah. perhaps it, just to conclude in 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 a sentence or something. Sorry, sorry, it was it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, I was coming to that. So we have some new technology uh, that is concurrent, uh, which gives a new opportunity for new algorithms. And what I'm trying to do is to take advantage of this technology. Yeah. Thank you. So th th thanks a lot for the wonderful talk, Hugo. Um, th thanks a lot.